Bora da sit my query bud D the Rowan do E and I don't think some of these curls have dried all the way, so that's why I'm gonna do my uh primer first. But, but where was I going with this? Right face. That's a thing I gotta put on, right? Of course. The uh the little rant I had in me just today. Just today actually like I don't know. It's one of those things that's kind of been in me off and on periodically, but... So, one of the things that I go to regularly for meeting people in the, uh, and, um, interacting with, uh, friends and acquaintances is the, uh, local Ann Arbor Witches Night Out at, uh, the Crazy Wisdom Bookstore and Tea Room out in downtown Ann Arbor on Main Street. Like I said, Witch's Night Out, and I've got a couple friends that go there. Um, one is a regular, she's uh, one of the people in charge of the associated Facebook group, but the uh, the meetup has been going on since um, long before, I think, oh god, I think we're coming into the 25th year of this. Uh, and then what happens is, um, but uh, but yeah, there's a thing. Right. And, uh, but yeah, I've got a few friends that go, um, some more regularly than others. And I was talking to, uh, um, friend of mine, uh, Raven. Uh, she is fairly out and proud of the fact that she's trans. And in spite of what a couple, um, recent videos in a row might lead one to believe. I'm more low-key um, in the meat space, as in real life. Uh, so yeah, like, I'm, I'm a bit more low-key about it. Like, I can be kind of unprecious about it at times, like, and there are things I just kind of assume, like, I don't know, like, if I'm topless in front of somebody enough, I just kind of assume they can put two and two together, but that's apparently not always the case, as evidenced by Worst X, who saw me hell of topless, and I was mentioning something, just, I don't know where the conversation started, but I briefly mentioned um, the lawyer who was helping me with my name change paperwork the year before, and uh, so, yeah, like, <laughs> it was funny, it was funny, like, I did everything that you're supposed to do as a good trainer, and, like, I was, like, completely, like, I wasn't, like, completely, I don't know, I, I don't know how you'd put it, but like I said, I was very unprecious about it, but before it became a pants-off situation, I just wanted to check in and make sure, like, you know I'm, you know, FTM, right? And he seemed genuinely surprised, so, I don't know. I've also had situations that, depending on uh, some people's definitions, might be considered stealth sex. I mean, only post-op, of course, but... Uh, um, and yeah, those guys just seem to be, they, they just tend to run with it. So, uh, I was talking with my friend Raven, like I said, she's fairly out and proud about being trans, whereas like, like I said, like, left to my own devices, um, off the internet, I'm more low-key about it, like, in certain situations, I kind of assume that people, if they don't know, they can at least take a guess, and that guess might turn out to be accurate. Uh, well, depending on their guess, of course, but, uh, but yeah, like I said, uh, I'm a bit more low-key, um, IRL, but, you know, whatever. So, uh, Raven and I were talking about a mutual friend of ours who, uh, she's a wonderful, wonderful person. But sometimes she's just, she's just so trusting and naive that you just, like, can't help but love her. Like, on the one hand, she's about my age. Maybe a little older. Um, but, yeah, a little bit older anyway. Uh, at least, I don't know. I'm not exactly sure how old she is. But I did this before my foundation. I'm kind of a... I've got concealer, like, <laughs> bright all over my face. What the hell is wrong with me today? I don't know. Uh, but, yeah. Where was I going? Um, right. Things and stuff. So, 
But yeah, the the, uh, the friend, the mutual friend between Rachel and I, she's a very, very sweet person. And she, but at the same time, because she's so sweet, sometimes she can be a little bit naive about things. And... Raven and I were talking like, yeah, we, we, we love friend, but sometimes y you just got to wonder, like, how did somebody, like, make it at least as many years as myself and be so trusting and, like, to the point, like I said, it, it's just so sweetly naive and, uh... You know, just, just so sweetly naive. Like I, I don't mean ill of friend. One time, um, I forget how it was brought up. I think it was brought up in a discussion about Pantheacon. And so, for those of you not um, active amongst the pagan blogosphere, oh gosh, <laughs> you. You lucky schmucks. Uh, you, you lucky schmuck. Um, who is unaware of the wonderful, wonderful clusterfup. As in that episode of Father Ted where there's like no swearing on the, I think it was classified as a beach. I love Father Ted. And because I love Father Ted, I'm so glad that... I bought my uh, copy of uh, the Immaculate Collection on DVD, so like, you know, all three series plus the uh, the Christmas special that had very little to do with Christmas. <laughs> but that was kind of their point, right? Like, you, you forgot, like, halfway through that this is actually like a Christmas special, right? This is all supposed to be taking place around the Christmas season. So, uh, so yeah, I bought that before... All of uh, Grand Linehem turned out to be saying some fairly busted ass things about trans people, and I'm like, yeah, I I, I don't want to get into that. It's like, you know, on the one hand, it's I, I kind of understand how some people might you know, come to these conclusions, but I disagree with their conclusions, right? Like, just because I understand how you got there doesn't mean I have to agree with it. And, but, uh, where was I going? Right. So, um, so yeah, if you're, uh, unfamiliar with the wonderful clusterfuck that is the pagan blogosphere, oh my god, he gods, it's, uh, it's something, it's something. So, Annually, I want to say, I actually forget what season, um, what the usual month anyway, I, I forget, because I've never been able to afford to go to PantheaCon, and PantheaCon is one of, if not the longest running pagan gathering of its type, it is... Um, held annually in the San Francisco Bay Area. It's been going on, I want to say, since the 80s, at least, maybe the 70s. So it's a very long-running thing. Uh, the, the term, the name Pantheacon, as in Pantheon plus Convention, you know, it's, it's clever, right? It's a, it's a wonderful little portmanteau there. So, where was I going with this? Uh, so then what happens, right? Pantheacon. So, a few years ago, and I, and I say a few because I'm not exactly sure how many. I want to say at least five. I'm pretty sure I was still at the Lansing House when the uh, majority of this happened. But, uh, yeah, Pantheacon. So, a few years, at least five ago, at Pantheacon, there was a Dianic ritual um, being done uh, by... Uh, Zazana Budapest, as uh, that is the name of the tradition she founded in the early 1970s. Now, I've gotten into arguments with people on YouTube comments for some dumbass reason, because against my better judgment, I read the comments sometimes, and then I let myself get pulled in to the unending pit of suck. I know it's going to suck. I know it's going to pick at my 
patience with people on the internet, but I do it anyway. Hey, there's where the other one went. I had a dedicated eyebrow brush. Where did it go? Well, there's a one, but not the one I'm looking for. So yes, uh, Pantheacon. So, Zosanna Budapest in the early 1970s, probably late 1960s, but her, uh, her big landmark case that, um, got her national attention was early 70s. She, uh, she was part of a court case that decriminalized in the state of California fortune telling. I think she was like reading tarot cards for, you know, money and so this decriminalized that as, you know, a uh, legit spiritual practice, something along those terms. I forget the exact details, but yeah, she was like one of the really instrumental people in that. So, um, if you're, uh, if you get paid to do that, uh, she's one of the people you get to thank for that. Unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, <laughs> Zazana Budapest, so this was like on my mind while I'm doing laundry. So this is like not quite shower thoughts. This is laundry thoughts. And I always fold my laundry when I'm down in the laundry room of the building because it's just, it's just easier to get it done down there than bringing it up here and risking getting distracted by cats, and then the cats are on the laundry, and it's still unfolded, and then I, and then they've been on it, you know, just like a couple days, and I might forget if I've washed it, so yeah, it's just like easier to do it downstairs, so I'm folding laundry downstairs, and this is what's going through my head, was thinking of, um, of Raven and I, and our conversation, uh, last week, now, uh, during the, uh, Crazy Wisdom meetup, about, uh, about Friend, and how she's just, like, so sweet, but, like, kind of naive, and, uh, and Friend seemed to be under the impression that, like, all women were welcome in, uh, Budapest's, uh, Dianic circles, but that, you know, and by all women, she assumed this included trans women as well. Now, I'm not going to get into a huge conversation about what exactly makes one a woman. Like, is biological sex real? And it, it's... Because where... Like, I... My, uh, my best ex, um, he has a bit of a medical background. He went to, um, 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 college for microbiology. He has a master's education in microbiology, which means, like, in a lab he can get a job, like, steaming test tubes or something. Like, he really needs to get his PhD to make any kind of money doing that. But, you know, whatever. So he's got a medical background, and, you know, to an extent, like, not like your primary physician would, but, you know, he's still got enough of a medical background, and he and I were together long enough, like, most of five years, and then living together as friends, because when you're gay and you've been together that long and had three cats together, it's like, you can break up, but you gotta stay friends unless one of you screwed up royally, because, you know, this is still a part of gay culture, like, if you can't stay friends, like, we know enough to destroy each other, like, if we can't stay friends, like, this is still a part of gay culture for some ungodly reason, but, uh, but, yeah, for some reason, like, me no one, you fuck you what, you got you mean, and even though me straighty, me all queer now, I'm like, ah, no you're not, hun. No you're not, because gay culture still has not unlearned, well, LGBT culture, because, you know, Scott's bisexual. But, yeah, it's like, LGBT culture still has not unlearned <laughs> some really toxic shit. Now, granted, Scott and I do not have a toxic friendship, but that's another, Earth my sharpener. Go oh, there it is. Right in front of me. That's interest. That's an interesting place for it. Like, right in a semi-clear spot on the, on the thing. How novel. So, uh, where was I going? Right. So, uh, so yeah, Scott's, Scott keeps up on various, like, microbe medical stuff, just for his own enjoyment. He works at a server farm, and... Like I said, he, uh, for reasons he did not pursue his, uh, PhD in 
microbiology, but he keeps up. He keeps up on the science, and yeah, like, biological sex is a thing, but it's more complex than a lot of people realize, and, you know, it's like, yeah, there are things about it that trans people cannot change. Like, we cannot, with current medical technology, alter chromosomes or insert an SRY gene or remove it from a person because it's the SRY that is, like, really important. So it's like, you know, with current medical knowledge, like, yes, there is a correlation between the presence or absence of a Y chromosome in um, uh, sexual dimorphism in humans and most other mammalian species. Granted, there are mammals who don't have a Y chromosome, uh, and that gene is called something else, but, you know, they're, th th it's more correlative than it is causative. It's the SRY gene that, under current theory, is the causative element of, um, at least, physical sexual dimorphism. But then again, there are still things that could, you know, like, go against the usual and create, you know, little outcomes that we regard as intersex. And... Like, like I said, the science behind, like, why are trans people seems to at least lean slightly favorably toward neurodivergence, so it's, like, like, mentally, like, gender is the neurological component of biological sex, because your brain, funny story, is a part of your body. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, like, you know, but at the same time, like, you know, like I said, we can't, you know, insert or remove an SRY gene, we cannot alter chromosomes, but we can alter um, the appearance of primary and secondary sex characteristics so that a trans person uh, can function um, sexually in all important ways as the gender we um, neurologically are, except for reproductively. Like, you know, so yeah, we can when you consider that the most consistently true definition across all species of biological sex is one's potential reproductive role for one species, um, yeah, we can't change from one r potential role to the other, we can't change from inseminative to gestative or vice versa, but we can neuter ourselves, which is a change! Like, that is literally a change. So, yeah, but... That's a, that's a sidetrack. So, yeah, uh, then things happen. And I was talking about Raven and Friend and Zosanna Budapest. So, yeah, like, Zosanna Budapest, her, uh, tradition, uh, which she calls Dianic Witchcraft, or the Dianic tradition, uh, Dianic something or other. She, she claims... Some kind of monolith over the terms Dianic with regards to witchcraft. And there are plenty of people who um, disagree with this to an extent. And, uh, but, you know, like, that's never been a tradition that I've been altogether interested. For reasons. So, uh, uh, where was I going? I was going there. Right. So, uh, this is on a Budapest. Her, um, her tradition of... Dianism is pretty much centered around the menstrual cycle to the point where uh, this it, where, where like the act of not only menstruating but giving birth and then eventually having menopause is like the ultimate manifestation of a woman's goddess powers and we're spelling woman W-O-M-B-Y-N-N-E. Because, you know, it's not just enough that you have to stress that there's a womb in a woman, but you gotta make it extra feminine, right? <laughs> I don't think she's ever used that spelling, but that's the spelling that I've come to use on the pagan blogosphere every time Zazana Budapest comes up. So, yeah. And yeah, that is, like, literally, um... The, uh, the, 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 that is basically her tradition in a nutshell. Like, it not only centers around the cisgender woman's experience, but it, it centers around a very specific experience and uh, portrays that very specific experience 
as the penultimate expression of a Wombine's goddess powers. Okay, so, like, just, uh, this did not dry long enough. Oh, well, most of them did. That's the important part. So, it's very obvious to anybody, really. Like, I even have friends who aren't exactly trans, but just consider themselves very feminist-minded, who, you know, like, got, um, got, a uh, got orf blocked by doctors for years, um, to, uh, you know, before getting, before finally being able to get their tubes tied. So it's like, you know, like, these are, these are women who, like, literally do not wish to give birth, and they figure, well, if I change my mind later, um, there's in vitro, or I could just adopt and, you know, or at least, like, foster a child, because, you know, why not, right? There's no reason not to. So, uh, so yeah, it's like, so, so needless to say, like, th th this leaves a bad taste in a lot of women's mouths. Like I said, like, even cisgender women, like, often walk away from this, you know, feeling like th this centers far too much on you know, a very specific experience that a lot of them simply don't want a part of, or if they do wish to engage in the cycle of, you know, motherhood and all of that, they want, <laughs> you know, this is like, this is not something they feel is their ultimate calling in life as an expression of their, you know, witch powers and all of that. Like, this, like, you know, they may be mothers, but it's like, that's not their only role. So, uh... <laughs> so, yeah, like, and, and you used to say the fact that, um, Budapest's, um, whole tradition is based on this menstrual cycle, um, this necessarily leaves out a lot of women who have an intersex condition, and that's that's like a that's a term that people like to weaponize in these discussions of biological sex and gender, and most people use it incorrectly. Like all intersex means is that you have some kind of condition that is broadly identified amongst certain medical texts because sometimes, like when you've got when we're talking stuff like uh, PCOS there can be wildly different medical opinions on whether or not it, you know, can be considered an intersex condition, because apparently there are other, there are several varieties of PCOS that, you know, may or may not, um, cause a, let's say, atypical hormone distribution, because everybody gets some amount of estrogen and testosterone within their body, if only through pituitary, um, but, yeah, where was I going? Right, so yeah, like, her her tradition, like, necessarily excludes, like, not just trans women, but a lot of women who are necessarily cisgender because they identify with the uh, gender based on their apparent sex at birth, but it turned out, like, because here's the thing, it's like, a lot of people don't even know they're intersex, like, a lot of intersex people don't even know until puberty, like, there were no signs, like, not even their parents knew, not even their doctors knew, until, you know, said person, at, you know, is you know, in an age which is typically pubescent and either it's not happening the way it should or it's happening a bit differently from what's expected. So, yeah, and some people don't even discover that they have an intersex condition until well into adulthood, with, um, oftentimes when they discover they're having some kind of fertility issues. But, you know, it's like, so there's like a wide variety of what's considered intersex. And so, yeah, like a woman who was... Uh, who has, um, complete androgen insensitivity syndrome. This means she has, um, a Y chromosome. Um, I can't remember if there, uh, is an SRY gene involved or if there can be an SRY gene involved, but basically something happened in the, you know, little genetic code, um, in utero. You, at least, you know, theory goes in utero, and fetal development did not, um, tell, tell, like, you know, certain cells, oh, hey, we gotta, like, form into, uh, penis and testes. 
you know, it said, yeah, no, nope, we're just going as usual. And, uh, I, I know this oversimplifies things, but, you know, like, in utero, um, all people develop at, at least with the appearance of, you know, female type until certain genes get a cue to behave, you know, male, right? So, uh, so yeah, like, as theory goes with CIIS, uh, she's got a Y chromosome, she may or may not necessarily have an SRY gene, um, but somehow signals get crossed and she develops in her mama's belly, uh, to, you know, apparently female, and most people with CAIS, complete androgen sensitivity syndrome, um, they're basically cisgender women. They just, like, you know, they never had a menstrual cycle. Um, I don't know the ratios, but, you know, there's a good chance, uh, she may have inert, um, you know, like, non-functional cryptorchid, um, testes in there that, like, you know, we're, like, nowhere near ever gonna drop, right? And her, uh, her other bits, like, you know, but, like, you know, externally, she looks and functions as a woman. <laughs> it's just, you know, she doesn't really have a functioning womb. Um, she may or may not have inert gonads that, you know, but, yeah, like, she's a woman. Like, by all rational definitions, she's a cisgender woman who just happens to be intersex. So, yeah, like... Like, so it's not only that uh, the Zana Budapest's tradition excludes trans women, necessarily excludes women with androgen insensitivity syndrome. It excludes women with Turner's syndrome. It excludes, um, it, it excludes a lot of intersex women who, for whatever reason, um, you know, it excludes women who, by some kind of horrible genetic lottery, I don't know, like, end up with ovarian cancer before they're even pubescent. Like, I'm sure it's happened at least once. So, like, you know, we've got an eight-year-old getting a full hysterectomy because why not? Um, like I said, I'm sure it happened at least once in the whole history of the universe. Um, or at least the history of human beings. Because, you know, like, we have an eight-year-old with uterine cancer, um, who, uh, you know, she's never gonna menstruate, she's never gonna be a mama, um, she wouldn't necessarily be excluded by, uh, by Susanna Budapest's uh, tradition, and because, you know, Budapest tradition places, like, the menstrual cycle, and by that, like, we mean, like, not just, you know, the, uh, the, the, the Moonbloods, M-O-O-N-B-L-U-D-Z, as we used to say on Live Journal when we were uh, <laughs> kind of poking some fun at him. Uh, if you could not, or even if you simply chose not to um, give birth and bring child to term, and, you know, you, you were somehow neglecting your goddess powers and your div truly divine magic of life creation, which, last I checked, still needed male seed in order to happen, and like I said, I'm like talking in like the broadest terms. Like, yes, I know there are trans women who will, you know, take a moratorium on their HRT in order to, um, either like freeze some of theirs or otherwise have biological offspring with another. I'm just like, like I said, I'm like, I'm talking to a pagan audience. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm not saying trans people can't ever, like myself, can't ever have problematic opinions on transness. I'm just saying, you know, I'm, I'm speaking to an audience that necessarily genders these terms. And I'm speaking of a uh, group of people that necessarily genders these functions. But yeah, so, uh, so yeah. And, like, I understand, like, in the 70s, there were probably a lot of necessarily cis, or at least ostensibly cis women, who needed to, like, you know, reclaim this, uh, this, uh, this natural bodily function as, uh, as, as something that, you know, they should not be ashamed of. Like, like we're talking, you know, like the late 60s, early 70s, we're talking sexual revolution, we're talking, like, hippies and, you know, free love movements and all of that, and 
Oh, shit. Yeah, Oberon Zell, he's gonna be at, uh, the, uh, Witch's Night Out. If not this coming month, then another month. Oh my gosh, that's gonna be so cool. <laughs> not like I'm especially, like, got a bone for Oberon Zell and his, uh, his, his teachings, but, you know, he's, he just, he's, there's so many interviews with him about, uh, polyamory on YouTube, just to check him out. He's, <laughs> he's like old hippie grandpa who's still kind of with it, you know, as far as, like, you know, being cool and progressive and all of that. Like, he's not old hippie grandpa who, you know, aged poorly. <laughs> but yeah, so, uh, so, so yeah, like I said, like, Zazana Budapest, like, I, like I said, I know, like, the, the late 60s, early to mid 70s, you know, we've got the sexual revolution going on, we've got, like, second wave feminism in full force and on everybody's mind in the news on Carson, you know, so, like, you know, the chat shows and everything, as well as, like, you know, news stories and all of that. Uh, and I understand, like, I grew up Catholic, okay? I grew up Catholic, and while by the 80s, like, it was less about, like, shaming kids about the bodily functions, there was still a sort of stigma about it, right? There's still this sort of stigma about certain bodily functions. And, uh, and, like, that's kind of the, that, that's kind of like the joke. Uh, that's, or at least that's like a huge joke I see with, uh, the character of Tammy, um, Larson on, uh, Bob's Burgers is, like, such a prude that, you know, she will insist that she doesn't even poop, right? Like, she is just such a prude, but at the same time, like, tries to, um, play herself off as being, like, so cool and with it and all of that. So, uh, so then what happens? Like, I don't know. I, I, I've seen how Pentecostals can be in about, you know, just anything that, you know, is seen as base and human. Like, I see how they can be. Like, I'm sure there are some, uh, women who grew up in that kind of environment and therefore, like, when they get into a pagan environment, you know, by, uh, you know, like, dissociating from their Pentecostal background, they will find it quite empowering indeed to, like, reclaim the Moonbloods as a source of their goddess powers. Like, but, uh, but yeah. So I'm just, like, putting glue on my face because I'm starting to do this thing, and it's kind of becoming my thing I do at the club. Uh, and I got not much time to keep going and wrap this up. But see, the thing that I find funniest about the whole, like, you know, Zazana Budapest and her, uh, I think it's correctly pronounced Budapest, but whatever. I, I, I barely paid attention to her. Uh, it's just like, you know, uh, this came up because, like, PantheaCon a few years ago. Now, this was not an official PantheaCon, like, this was not officially on the PantheaCon schedule, okay? This was in one of the courtesy suites, I believe. And so, like I said, it said, uh, biological women only. So, of course, there are, like, some trans women who, and their supporters, uh, I'm dropping everything, who decided to have this kind of, you know, like, sit in outside the courtesy suite. And they didn't block anybody from entering or whatever, but it was a thing that happened. And there was, like, the, the Kaya Coven, come as you are, C-A-Y-A, -A, Kaya Coven, um, who did this other little demonstration that, um, Yesha Rabbit, I believe, is the name of the woman in charge of that, and she's just like, we're just holding space between the two, and I'm just like, what the hell is this supposed to be? Like, like, what the hell? Like, okay, but whatever, right? So, um, so yeah, like, this was a thing, and apparently, like, this was the first a lot of people had been aware that Zuzana Budapest is not fond of trans women because like then she just like kept going off on Facebook for like the next month and some like it was kind of hilarious like even after Pantheacon like she was just going off like 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 the, like your crazy you know like racist uncle or at the at at Thanksgiving right she's she's just like keeps going burp, 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 and I'm just like what the hell woman like like, yeah, you're gonna have your supporters no matter what, and you're gonna have your detractors no matter what. Like, literally, that is a fact that you should have been used to, like, for, like, what, at that point, like, 40-some years, because, you know, um, since at least the late 60s, she, you know, like, it was either late 60s or early 70s, she started that, uh, her Dianic tradition. I know she put a book out about it in the 70s, but that doesn't mean, like, when it started. That just means, like, when she put out a book, right? Um, so yeah... <laughs> and see, the funny thing is, is that this whole, like, basis for her tradition, like, it is, like I said, it's based on the menstrual cycle, and she uses the maiden mother crone model, which 
is not really a thing that we see in ancient paganism. This is something that we see, like, this is basically the invention of Robert Graves. And I have, like, so many rants in me about Robert Graves, but they all basically boil down to the fact that Robert Graves uh, had some serious daddy issues, amongst other things, um, and he, he literally, like, he would put out these, like, when he was, like, first writing his books, like, he would put out calls to academics, and, you know, at least early on anyway, and would, like, use his father's name, because his father was an academic working in Gaelic studies and you know, like, the, the universities in the British Isles. So, like, he would, like, basically, like, ride his father's coattails to, like, solicit help from, you know, like, academics. And he's not a Gaelic studies academic. He's, like, a, a neoclassicist sort of thing. Like, his thing is, like, less anthropology and more, like, folklore. So, like, he was, like, rejecting um, all information that was supplied by the anthropologists in Gaelic studies. And, like, he was, like, rejecting all information of theirs that did not conform to his uh, pet ideas. So... Like I said, like, this is all just, like, like the whole Maiden Mother Crone thing is legitimately the invention of Robert Graves. Yes, we see some goddesses that kind of, like, if you squint, um, can be a part of this. But it's, like, when I was, like, more staunchly a Hellenic Reconstructionist, it, it was a very common thing, like, on the email lists and the live journal groups to see people come in and realize that they had to completely unlearn the notion of Hecate as crone when in actual Greek mythology, Hecate is Kore or maiden. And, but she's also a maiden who is a mother, like she is the mother of Medea, you know, who is the witch god. And yes, there was, like, ah, this is something that recons like to argue with me about, or rather other recons like to argue with me about, like, oh, well, Medea was just a witch from, like, the sword. I'm like, no, there was, like, a legit cult of Medea. Like, there were, like, like the, 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 um, uh, ah, uh, crap, I'm forgetting the Greek, I'm forgetting the Greek term, um, um, par uh, par Parkathos, uh, Pharmacassos, Pharmacassos Islands, like, literally the witch islands, I forget the, I forget the Greek for witch, but it's like Pharmacassos, uh, islands, like, literally the witch islands, this is where these women would, like, they had their temple to Medea, and they would, you know, frequently, like, come to the mainland or other Greek islands to, like, sell their tinctures and herbs, but, like, this was their, this was their calling, their calling was to worship Medea at the temples to Medea on the Pharmacassos Islands, like, the, the witch islands, literally the witch islands, like, so, yeah, like, Hecate is, like, maiden, but she's also mother of Medea, she is the mother of Greek witchcraft. Basically, like, anybody who says otherwise, it's just like, like, Connie, please stop reading Plato and masturbating furiously because you're wrong. So, uh, so yeah, like, <laughs> it was very common that we would get people coming in and a lot of times they would end up becoming very apologetic about it because, like, their previous understanding of Hecate was just, like, so deeply infused with Gravesism that has nothing to do with ancient mythology, or at least not ancient Greek mythology. It's got very little to do with any kind of actual, like, ancient mythology. It is definitely its own kind of mythology and folklore, but it's, it's the Gravesisms, like, their ties to ancient polytheistic mythology is tenuous at best, okay? Like, it's, it's a very loose association at best. And I'm sure there are um, crone goddesses who will answer to the name Hecate. Like, this is not out of line with ancient polytheism. Like, it was just kind of accepted that there were certain deities, gods and goddesses, and um, hermaphroditic um, entities, such as, well, hermaphroditos. Um, but, uh, you know, who would answer to several names, like epithets. To some extent, like, there were also, like, some you know, instances where it's like, it, it's clear that this, um, you know, that this was indeed a completely different deity, but there were enough similarities to say like, oh, this is like, instead of, you know, Zeus, um, you honor, I don't know, I I'm brain farting right now, so let's just go with Roman and say, you honor Jupiter instead of Zeus. Uh, so yeah, like, that is, you know, their thing. Like, there are enough differences that... You know, they are distinct, but this is, like, kind of what you do instead of what, you know, we do. So, that is, like, ancient polytheology in the simplest terms. Like, people really like to misinterpret, uh, interpretatio, um, gracie, um, or interpretatio romanus, uh, very, 
Oh gosh, I get so many. I get. I, I used. This is one of the reasons that <laughs> I've I've kind of like kind of like gone off the, uh, the the strictly recon boat to you know. But uh, but yeah, like just getting into so many arguments with people, and it's like uh, we're both convinced we're right, but I'm actually pulling up sources, and it just gets very frustrating for me at a point. And that's the thing is like, <laughs> um, it is uh, Zazan Budapest, her um, Dianic uh, witchcraft is pretty much based on Gravesism and um, you know the uh, the Diana of her mythology. Um, as best as anybody can tell, is the invention of, I'll put his actual name here, um, uh, who wrote the, uh, the Gospel of Eradia. A and the Gospel of Eradia, it's not completely divorced from ancient mythology, but it's definitely a composite of ancient mythology and some Italian folk tales and all of that. Like, and it's gotten to a point where, like, this is, this can be seen as legit mythology. Like, there are, I think there's enough, um, personal gnosis from other pagans who have, you know, um, communed with a deity, um, a goddess, usually, who answers to Araradia, um, and her parent deity, I think, Diana, um, as per, it's been forever since I've read, uh, Gospel of Araradia. Uh, or Aradia, Gospel of the Witches, but, uh, so yeah, um, oh yeah, it's, uh, it also takes a bit from, uh, the, uh, the Sophia, um, 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 figure in early Gnostic mythology, so, <laughs> so yeah, like, this is just completely funny to me, that Zuzana Budapest, like, her whole, like, little, like, you know, first you're the, first you're the maiden before, before you're menarche, and then you, you become, like, it, and then you become, like, the, the, then you have puberty, and you are, uh, primed as a vessel for being the mother, and, um, embodying this full strength of the goddess, and then you have your menopause, and you become crone, and you become the wise woman of the tribe. But see, like, this little cycle was the invention of an old man with daddy issues. <laughs> like, that is, like, the best summary of Robert Graves. Is he's just, like, this old man with daddy issues, riding daddy's coattails, while at the same time taking a crap on his daddy's work at the same time. It's like... Oh my gosh, like, <laughs> I would love to see some kind of psychological, um, breakdown of Robert Graves. Just, 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 just to have all of his daddy issues just, like, spelled right out, because uh, that's basically what it is, right? So, it's like, she's taking, like, like, she's, she, she, she presents this as, like, tuning in to the ancient a goddesshood, and I'm like, yeah, like, there's some ancient mythology, but then say that, at best, this is, like, a new mythology that has been revealed to certain authors to bestow upon a populace that needed it at this time, um, whether they were aware that they were a conduit to these deities and their mythology or not is, you know, anybody's guess at this point, since they're all dead, uh, but, uh, Charles Godfrey Leland, that's his name, Araria, the Gospel of the Witches, uh, Charles Godfrey Leland. Pretty sure that's it. I'll look it up when I, in editing. But yeah, so, so like, she's, she, she's, she's based her, uh, and this is like, like I said, I find this so incredibly hilarious in an ironic way. Like, this is classic comic irony, is, you know, she is, uh, because this, this was like one of my language arts specialties, was, you know, I, like, uh, Western humor. <laughs> I took classes in Western humor. Uh, like I said, I, I'm a polytheist. I'm like, if you believe that you have interacted with, you know, certain deities who answer to these names, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're, you know, deities that were known to ancient peoples, like, even if they answer to ancient names, but it means that, you know, I I'm sure you have, you know, interacted with a deity of this sort, who um, answers to these names, or this one particular name, and that is cool. And I have no reason to doubt you. It's just like, just because, you know, your Aros appears to you in this way, doesn't necessarily mean that is the same deity I have come to know as Eros, um, and that's okay. Like, there can be, like, 
even uh it's even argued that Hesiod, um, the uh, the Greek um, cosmologist poet, um, it's even argued that Hesiod uh, actually like Hesiod did um, spell out exactly that there were uh, two goddesses who answered to the name of Eris. Uh, one was there to um, cause man hardship that, that would you know, explicitly harm him, and the other uh, would cause man hardship that would be there to help him grow. Like, one was a goddess of just straight up adversity. The other was an heiress who, <laughs> you know, threw you hard tasks in hopes that you would figure it out. Like, or, or at least, like, knowing that, you know, like, when you get through this, you will become a better person for it. And so, yeah, like, he explicitly, Hesiod explicitly says, yeah, like, there are two heiresses. There are two goddesses who answer the name of heiress. One is like this, one is like this. And, um, and people have argued that he also, um, identified two deities as Eros, but the fact that he didn't explicitly say that in any of his surviving writings, like, especially the, um, the, uh, Theogony that, you know, also references the two heiresses, I'm just like, there's no reason to believe that this is the same, because I've got one with parallel text, and it's like, I'm like, okay, I, like, my, my abilities to read Greek are pretty minimal, but I'm like, looking at what he actually says, it's like, eh, we, we can't really say that he's identified two eros, but he's definitely, he's explicitly identified two eris. So, <laughs> but yeah, like I was saying, I just find it, like, so, like, it, it is classic comic irony that uh, Zuzana Budapest has founded a tradition of witchcraft that is literally based entirely around the cycle of menarche, um, menstruation, motherhood, um, menopause, right? Like, this is, it's literally based around the menstrual cycle. If you do not engage in the menstrual cycle for any reason, you are explicitly left out of this. Granted, she focuses mostly on trans women who do not, because they do not experience the menstrual cycle, but like I said, like, there are literally cisgender women who, due to being born intersex, are literally excluded from this as well. Uh, but, you know, of course. Uh, but then again, if you, like, like, at the same time, like, they'd have to explicitly identify themselves as intersex for, and even then, like, people take guesses on whether she would or would not be okay with that. But, uh, like I said, like, if you take, if you take what she's written as, you know, like, exactly, it's like, this explicitly excludes intersex women as well. But that's another story for another time. Or, actually, I went all through that anyway, bef previously. So, uh, but yeah, like, so she's based this around the menstrual cycle, and she says, this, like, this is, like, um, like, like, the one true way for women to, um, like I said, ostensibly cisgender women, to truly interact with their divine, life-giving goddess force. Um, but it's based completely around, um, the new mythology, like I said, like, I give it a charitable interpretation sometimes, you know, I give Le Leland, I give Leland a more charitable interpretation than I give Robert Graves, just because modern paganism is so brutally infused with Gravesism that, like, especially people who, like, were, like, Celtic-flavored Wiccan or, you know, in ADF or something, but then they get into Celtic Reconstructionism, and there's like, holy shit, I have to completely unlearn everything I thought I knew about, um, you know, Celtic deities, right? So, uh, but yeah, like, modern paganism is so, like, thoroughly infused with Gravesism, right? But, uh, so yeah, like, she has, like, at best, like, the best parts, you know, are a new mythology, like, revealed to a, a man, a man, a symbol of the patriarchy, for he is a cisgender man with a penis, and another man, and a far more problematic one, because his entire career was based around his own daddy issues, so, <laughs> like, like, her entire tradition, like, which she says is, you know, like, all about embracing your goddess power as a life-giving, childbearing wombine. <laughs> but it's based around mythology revealed to men who may or may not have 
recognize this as a new mythology being revealed, right? Um, in a sense, you know, of course, obviously there are people who, you know, have a relationship with this mythology, and I'm, like, I'm not here to say this is, like, you know, not, you know, goddesses who have revealed themselves to you in your own practice, but it's like, I, like I said, I, I have a very polytheistic theology. It's like, I'm like, yeah, sure, you, you have interacted with a goddess named Hecate, who answers to the name Hecate, and yeah, she, she seems very much like, you know, what Robert Graves, like, had to completely rewrite to make her fit this model of his, because he was a folklorist writing for the laity. Like, he was not writing for academics. He was not writing for people interested in um, more hardcore anthropology and hardcore, like, you know, ancestral folklore. He was writing for the laity, right? So he was writing for the common person who was at least kind of like, ha had this kind of, like, romantic interest in folklore, and that's who he was writing for, because he knew that's where you made the, ac the good money. Like, if you write an academic book, you might sell, like, I don't know, you might sell a hundred copies a year, but only to other academics and big-time nerds. But, if you write a book for the laity, you're gonna sell thousands of copies a year, and l laugh your daddy issues all the way to the bank, and Freudel's just gonna be there, like... But, yeah, <laughs> and that's just something I just find incredibly hilarious, is that she has designed this, this tradition of witchcraft that is, like, all about the womb and the cycle of, you know, menstruation and motherhood and then, like, you know, becoming the wise grandmother um, and all of that. And yet all of her sources... Um, or at least her main sources, anyway. Obviously, like, she she had some influence from uh, Margaret Murray's works. Kind of everybody did at the time. Um, even Robert Graves took some influence from Margaret Murray's works. But, like, y you know, like, we look at her primary sources into the, you know, like, like what, you know, mythology of her Dianic tradition is public. Like, we look at, at this, and this is like, like, this is like Charles Godfrey Leland's Aradia, this is Robert Graves, like, you know, maiden mother crone cycle that is not a thing in ancient mythology. Like, we, this is literally not a thing in ancient mythology. This is completely Robert Graves' invention, this maiden mother crone cycle of, you know, deities. Like, th th this is completely his own invention. This is, th this has been proven beyond a shadow of a doubt. Like, this, this was not a thing in ancient mythology. Like I said, at best we can see some goddesses that, like, if you squint, you can, like, maybe... You know, like, I can see where Robert Graves got this inspiration, but, like, yeah, like, this, this was not a thing that existed in ancient mythology. There was, like, you know, there were goddesses who did this thing, and goddesses who did that thing, and even goddesses who, um, were revealed as maiden in the mythology, in the art, and all of that, like, they were... Um, you know, they could also be mothers. Like, there was no reason you couldn't be both. Like, you're a deity. Like, why would you be confined <laughs> to this one role, right? Like, this is, like, this is, this is polytheology right here. Like, just because this may be a primary role doesn't mean you also don't fulfill these roles as well. Whereas, you know, in, uh, Budapest's, um, tradition, like, a woman can only fulfill one role at a time. She is either this or this, or this, at any one time in her life. And once she is this, she can no longer be this again, right? So, <laughs> and that's what I find so ironic and hilarious, is she's got this complete, like, like, if this were coming, like, if this were coming from a man, people would recognize this as, like, a completely sexist interpretation of goddesses and paganism and a woman's role in the pagan community, but since it's coming from, you know, a, a, a cute old lady, well, she's a cute old lady now, like, she was much young, I don't know, maybe she's one of those people like my fifth grade teacher who was, like, always 80. <laughs> I swear, my fifth grade teacher was always 80. That woman hated me. But, uh, like, seriously, oldest nun ever. It would not surprise me if she was still alive, and they're just, like, moving her around, you know, amongst the order, like, to, you know, from school to school, just to, like, you know, so people don't pick up on the fact that she, she's she been alive since 1690, right? 
<laughs> but, uh, but yeah, as I was saying, like, you know, she's, she's got this very, very patronizing sort of interpretation of, like, what a woman's power even is. It's like, like, this is the woman's, like, ultimate goal in life is to, like, you know, first, like, squirt out her moon bloods and then become a mommy and then, like, have a few children, at least you know, at least one anyway, and then become like the sage old lady of the tribe. Like, like, like this is what Zazana Budapest believes is like a woman's ultimate goal and ultimate aspirations in life and magic should be. And yet, there are still people who whinge about how like, oh, it's so sad that the trans has decided that a true elder of our community, and I'm like, honey, like a, a seriously patronizing ass backwards, like, tradition from the moment she first like put out her book like shit not even before she put out her first first book about it like this is just like like how do you not see this like like i and like i said i understand like in the 60s there was a time and place for this a lot of women were like you know like our bodies ourselves came out and everybody was like on uh was like on the chat shows about it and how like this was so scandalous that like women were learning about their bodies and like what's going on down there uh, and like it, they're being instructed about this by like a a, a, a woman who wrote this book oh my god and it's not like talking about like your delicate flower it's not using flower euphemisms it's like calling them the parts and it's telling women that they can like have an orgasm and I'm like so yeah, like I understand, like the '60s, '70s. This was a really weird time for human sexuality because like old standards were going out, new standards were coming in, and like people were throwing out like various tests to the waters to see like which new standards were going to stick around. And so like there was this, you know, it was this point in the 20th century when like people were sort of refashioning themselves and all of that, but. We've come to a point where it's like, yes, this can be, you know, definitely a goal. And, you know, there are definitely going to be, like, you know, cisgender women who want to, you know, fulfill this role. And this is something they will find most fulfilling. And that is valid. Like, you can do that and be fine. But you don't have to. But if you want to, like, like if you want to, like, you know, ideally you will do this without any social pressures to do so. But at the same time, it's like, when you've got this, this tradition that kind of like elevates this role as like the pinnacle of a cisgender woman's, you know, magical powers, and then like explicitly refers to it as like, you know, like the, the true power of a woman, you know, so like you're using like social gender terminologies to refer to functions of biological sex, and so, like I, like I said, I, I get, I understand why, like, it's come to this point where it's like, is this even relevant anymore? And then you gotta figure, you know, like, I can see, like, I can see, like, I am okay if people want to just, like, call it the menstrual mysteries instead of women's mysteries, like, she still insists on doing, and that's, like, I mean, you know, on the good side, she's gonna die in, a, you know, like, probably about ten years, right? But, uh, but yeah, like, like, if you want to call it the menstrual mysteries, that's fine. I understand, like I said, like, I, I'm, like, hardcore polytheist, and I understand that some people feel this spiritual calling, like, and, um, you know, to, uh, to, to honor this as part of their practice. That is, like, okay. And, yes, there are specific, um, rites that only people who perform certain functions either, you know, biologically or even, like, in their society can fulfill. And in ritual, there are, you know, like, your tradition may not be my tradition, but it's, like, at the same time, I'm just, like, you know, like, different people can perform different functions in ritual, so that's cool, and we should celebrate those differences, and, you know, like, if we have, like, I don't know, if you want to make any changes to ritual, you gotta have a really good reason, uh, because I figure, like, if we know this has worked, like, in ancient times, there's not necessarily a need to change it, but if it doesn't apply modernly, then, like, yeah, we can make alterations. I don't know. I'm gonna go into, like, my polytheology and another thing, but it's, like I said, I find it just kind of hilarious. Like I said, this is, like, classic irony that Zana Budapest, <laughs> like, has not just, like, so patronizingly based her entire tradition of witchcraft around the menstrual cycle, but, like, 
it, it is pretty much based on mythology revealed to very patriarchal men. Like, <laughs> like, like Robert Graves was not one of the, you know, huddled, you know, proletariat masses. He was born into affluence, right? Uh, Charles Godfrey Leland, again, we see a man born into affluence who, you know, was able to, you know, in his travels as a, you know, educated folklorist of academia, you know, was able to take these travels and composite this mythology, you know, revealed to him in some, you know, combination of his travels, right? And, uh, you know, and Robert Graves, like, yes, he was clearly taking out his own daddy issues in the construction of his mythology, but in the years since he published it, it's become meaningful to a lot of people. I'm not going to come down on anybody who, you know, is just like, and I'm like, you know, like, yeah, you recognize a certain, like, crone aspect goddess who answers to the name of Hecate. But, you know, like I said, like, even the ancients didn't believe that, you know, just because, you know, there are two very different deities who answer to a particular name doesn't mean that they're the same, that they're necessarily the same deity, right? Like I said, like Hesiod and the two Eris. Like, there were two goddesses named Eris, as per Theogony, right? So, it's like, yeah, they both answered to the name Eris, but uh, Hesiod recognized them as two very different goddesses. So, yeah, like, you know, you, I'm not saying your Kron Hecate is wrong, I'm saying it's not a Hecate that the ancient Greeks would recognize, and that's okay. That's okay! That's completely okay! So, yeah, but yeah, I just find it funny. I just find it so funny that she, like, elevates cisgender womanhood and motherhood into this high magic concept of sorts, um, but her mythology is predominantly based on something revealed to men, and very patriarchal men, who are very much cogs in a patriarchal system that it, 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 I just, like I said, I just find it funny. I just find it funny. So, uh, hopefully you find it funny, and hopefully I can get this edited down to <laughs> a reasonable amount of time that hopefully people will be more inclined to watch, and hopefully I have not missed last bus to the, uh, to the club. So, as always, take care of yourselves, wear your sunscreen, uh, even in winter, you know, like a 30 SPF in winter, a 50 or 70 in the summer, that's fine. Just wear your sunscreen so that, like, you can look as fabulous as I do at 40 when you hit that age, right? Uh, uh, as always, you know, thumb icons below to denote your um, enjoyment or lack thereof with my nonsense. Uh, subscribe bar and bell notifications if you have not yet put those on your things and you wish to enjoy more of this nonsense at a regular enough interval. I don't know. I do one video a week on average, whatever. And uh, as always, if you have more dollars than cents, I have a PayPal tip jar and Patreon in the links below. Uh, as to a special thanks to my friend Ali Valkyrie, another polytheist, uh, and she's also a writer and activist, uh, one of my pa patron supporters, and to another Patreon supporter who I know by the name of Allison, who's been a Patreon supporter of mine for quite a while. Uh, again, thanks so much. Um, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> and, um, bats and kisses, and take care of yourselves, and goodbye!